What is photography? A photograph is an image of the outer world formed in a camera obscura by light passing through a lens, the reflection of which can be seen by the photographer on his focusing screen. During the instant of exposure, this image is invisibly inscribed on the sensitive surface placed at the rear of the camera. Thanks to a developing bath, this latent image can be developed in darkness. After a second hyposulfite bath, which dissolves the remaining silver bromide, the image is said to be fixed, that is, made insensitive to light. The picture is negative, shadows are white, and light areas are dark. These values revert to normal when a positive print is made. But who invented photography? Why, Daguerre, of course. There are statues of Daguerre all over the world, like this one in America. The first practical patented camera bears his name. Well, you're wrong. It was his partner, Nicephore Nietz, who 15 years before Daguerre fixed an image in this camera obscura, now on display at the Chanel Museum with the first iris diaphragm. Just a moment, others will say, photogravures invented by Nietz and daguerreotypes are not real photographs. The father of modern photography is the Britisher Talbot. He was the first to print positive proofs from a negative. Suppose we go back now and try to get a clear picture. In the Paris of Balzac's time, which he painted from the heights of Montmartre, an unknown provincial, Louis-Jacques Mandé Daguerre, is going to achieve fame and fortune. Later, this temple of Solomon will bear witness to his fertile imagination. But the primary characteristic of his work, as here in his Bridge of Pierre, is his love of precise detail, his documentary approach. His science of perspective attests to his training as an architect. Add to this a striking sense of light, all of which results in what we would today call an almost photographic realism. For this study of a ruined chapel at 36, Daguerre is awarded the Legion of Honor. For several years, he has already applied to the Ambigu Comique Theater of Paris, as in this stage set for Elodie, his talent for luminous effect. Finally, in 1822, he opens a show which sets Paris agog. The Diorama, an exhibit of pictorial views heightened by changes of light. Spectators sat in the dark 30 feet from a huge canvas painted on both sides. From backstage, huge reflecting panels cast light on the canvas, either directly or by transparency, creating the effect of night and day. Pictures alone are not sufficient for a show. In order to imagine it, Let's peer into one of the optical toys of those times, reproducing in miniature the diorama pictures. They even waxed poetic over the most celebrated view. saint Etienne du mont noble pile worthy of the artist's clever brush, striking in its effect. A veil is cast over the halo of day. Graduated shadows attenuating light, which dimly pierces the gloom. It is time for midnight mass. And then a surge of brilliant shafts of increasing intensity illuminates the prayers of the faithful in the hallowed nave as if by magic. 
But soon, dawn melts the shadows and day replaces night. But Daguerre's ambition soon transgresses the limitations of the diorama. Ever since the 18th century, chemists knew that silver compounds darkened when exposed to light. Professor Charles, the French physicist of revolutionary times, even carried out a curious experiment on this subject. Profile portraits on the silhouette machine were then all the rage. In his classes at the Louvre, Professor Schauler used to place the head of one of his pupils in a powerful shaft of solar light on a paper background coated with a silver compound. The profile shadow was soon outlined in black, but the lighted part of the paper would quickly darken, and when the head was removed, its shadow appeared in white before being darkened in turn under the action of the light. Daguerre determined to carry the experiment further. To plot the motifs of his settings, he used a camera obscura equipped with a lens. His thought was to let the light itself print the picture on a sensitive surface placed to the rear of the camera, instead of having the sketcher make a tracing of its reflection on the focusing screen. But on the peaceful banks of the river Sone, someone else had already carried out this experiment. This middle-class Frenchman with a passion for invention was Nicéphore Niepce. And between motorboat tests and the cultivation of woad in 1822, he had taken the first known photograph by impression on a tin plate smeared with bitumen placed in a camera obscura, a picture of his courtyard. He had adopted this new substance, rendered white and insoluble by light, after unsuccessful tests with silver compounds. The next step was to dissolve the remaining bitumen on the part of the plate not affected by the light. The whitish fragments of solidified bitumen formed luminous dots, while shadows were represented by the exposed tin. The sun having shifted during the eight hours required for the exposure, the walls opposite each other were also seen to be lighted. It was through the good offices of an optician, Monsieur Chevalier, that Daguerre and Niepce began to communicate with each other. Niepce was mistrustful at first and simply sent Daguerre a photogravure, that is, the reproduction of a print by transparency without using a camera obscura. However, they did finally end up by seeing each other. And three years later, a partnership was formed between the aging dreamer and the dynamic Parisian artist. Profits were shared alike. With Niepce contributing his bitumen process and Daguerre improving upon the camera obscura and bringing his many talents into play. We know little about their association. It is probably at this time that this life study was made by Niepce. Only one reproduction is left. After the death of Niepce, three years later, Daguerre will carry on his research alone for another five years. He wants more experiments on silver compounds, but more important, he discovers the notion of developing. This is his method. First, a high polish was given to a thin silver plate. Then it was exposed in darkness to iodine vapors, forming a layer of silver iodide sensitive to light. Still in darkness, the plate was then placed to the rear of the camera obscura. Thereupon, the covering was taken off the lens. A relatively short exposure time, five minutes instead of several hours, sufficed for the image to form. But it was a latent, invisible image. 
In order to reveal the image, the plate was exposed to metallic mercury vapors. The mercury was seen to adhere to the spots which had been exposed to the light. And the more brilliant the light, the heavier the coating of mercury. Finally, the plate was washed with hot salt water to dissolve the remaining silver compounds. This fixed the image, or in other words, made it insensitive to light. A silver plate is a mirror, white on a light background, black if reflecting a shadowy area. This sheen, the primary fault which lends the daguerreotype its particular charm, is characteristic. The image appears in negative or positive form according to whether it is oriented on a light or on a dark background. The first of Daguerre's plates were still life studies. Their advantage was the possibility of long exposure. Then Daguerre, from his residence on the Rue des Marais, near his diorama, ventures to make a first view of the exterior. A plunging view on Saint-Martin Boulevard. The seething city, represented by the engravings of the time, the Paris of the horse and buggy days, is there for his camera to discover. Sky, water and stone are perfect subjects, requiring no more than 10 minutes exposure time. If the boulevards appear deserted, it is because people moved too fast to remain in the picture. Only one man is visible in the lower left-hand corner. He's having a shine. This is the first man ever to have been photographed. These documents are sent to Arago, the illustrious French physicist and parliamentarian or Daguerre hopes to sell his patent to the state. Arago is enthusiastic. He gives Daguerre his support. And on August 19, 1839, at the French Institute, grouping the science and fine arts academies, after having described the flawlessness of the process, he proclaims, photography is a gift from France to the whole world. The government granted a 10,000 francs annuity to the inventors. 6,000 were for Daguerre, who had also ceded his diorama rights to the state. The diorama had just burned to the ground, and Daguerre was ruined. But at the same time in London, a British amateur, Fox Talbot, claims first rights for the fixation of an image in a camera obscura. He had begun by simple negative impressions by transparency on silver compound paper. But a few months later, he publishes a complete method. Rather than making direct positive prints like Daguerre, from negative paper which has been made translucid, he turns out inverted positive prints on paper. This process is still in use at the present time. These extraordinary Talbot types show Talbot at work. Exposure lasted only a few minutes for he too had discovered a latent negative, which he used gallic acid to develop. To fix it, he used sodium hyposulfite, a substance which had been suggested to him by the illustrious British physicist Herschel. It was adopted by Daguerre and is still in use. Finally, to obtain a positive print, he exposed the negative to the sun on a frame. The Pencil of Nature was the title of Talbot's first published album of photographs.
paradoxically, in England, Talbot's disciples were rather few. For his own protection, he had taken out extremely rigorous patents. But in Scotland, where Talbotypes were not patented, one of his followers became a master. This man was a painter who succeeded in photographing the mystical luminosity of the Scottish countryside by extremely clever use of the granular and somewhat hazy properties of paper printing. This painter, Octavius Hill, discovered the use of exposure time in the stylization of an attitude. Probably to this very day, he remains the greatest of all portrait photographers. in France, Hippolyte Bayard had also used paper, but not in the same way. This self-portrait dates from 1839, the year of the first daguerreotypes. What we admire in these paper prints today is a certain substance, an almost pictorial style which art photography was to come back to in later years. At the time, the coarse grain was considered inferior to the finesse of the daguerreotype. This opposition between haziness and sharpness is even more striking in portraits than in landscapes. Compare this Bayard a self-photograph on paper to this daguerreotype of the inventor by Sabatier Blou. The fact that reproduction of a daguerreotype was impossible was not considered a fault by either Daguerre or by the public. On the contrary, it conferred upon it a unique character, like a work of art, a valuable miniature. The fact is that daguerreotypes today have become collector's items. As all over France, the new invention was on everybody's lips. It was jokingly said that daguerreotypes, which are hardly flattering and love the truth, uglify beauty. But the new invention was all the rage, and every man had to have his own personal portrait. It was a sort of daguerreotypomania. of the cartoonists, the greatest of them all, Daumier, sang a hymn to this new democratic art. Before you, sublime inventor, art disdained the poor, a toy for painters and sculptors. Today, the humble have daguerre. With Chevalier's portable camera, the news picture came into being. As for portrait photography, 
It was facilitated by the combined lenses, reducing exposure time to just, and by the discovery of accelerating substances such as bromine. Not five years had elapsed since the first daguerreotype when Foucault was already making a microphotograph of a skin cell, photographing the image of the sun on a plate. And soon afterwards, the image of the moon. And as from 1844, the daguerreotype broke free from its bonds with the panoramic camera. Finally, in the same year, the third dimension is added through stereoscopy. While Parisians go daguerreotyping to the very confines of Siberia, the daguerreotype is conquering Europe. The greatest German master is Seltzner from the Hamburg Art Circle, who left us these pointed and yet romantic pictures. The very proper gentleman. The dancer. The Oberleutnant. And Mother Albert, the market gardener. But it's in the United States that daguerreotypes made the most rapid and striking progress. They were introduced by Morse, the inventor of the telegraph. The American epic lives again in daguerreotypes. The old side wheelers on the Ohio River. The locomotives in the prairie. The camp during the gold rush days. Mawindaus, the proud Indian chieftain. And Lola Montez. Not to speak of Niagara Falls. Finally, Caesar, the last Negro slave of New York. And President Lincoln. In the second half of last century, the daguerreotype has its temple several stories high in New York. But its rival, the Talbotype, has also been perfected. What will be the outcome of this duel between the silver plate and paper? This, a negative on glass. Yes, glass, that perfectly smooth and transparent substance, preserved the finesse of the metal image while improving the accuracy of paper printing. A first albumin process was invented by Niepce's nephew, Niepce Saint-Victor. But the collodion process, invented shortly afterwards by the Britisher Scott Archer, carried the day. Let's look into it. The gluey liquid is carefully spilled on the plate and spread over its whole surface. Then the plate is sensitized by plunging it into a silver bath before being exposed in the dark room while still damp. Next, the developer is spilled on the plate all at once. When the image is sufficiently clear, it is washed and fixed with hyposulfite. Finally, it is put on a frame for printing on paper. Albumin paper was used for many years, which had the rather curious consequence of hiking up the price of eggs. With collodion, exposure time, which since Nieps had come down from an hour to a minute, was reduced to almost a second. A breaking wave, and the busy Place de la Concorde could finally be taken from life. The snapshot is just around the corner. 
1851, with the invention of collodion, photography is reborn. A hundred rustic studios crop up as if by magic. For one franc fifty, anyone can have a portrait made. But famous photographers such as Carja photograph celebrities like Baudelaire. And Sarah Bernhardt poses for Nadar. Both an art and an industry. The era of adventure is over. And Daguerre, during the last months of his life, has gone back to painting. He has just one more still life deception to his credit. Church of Brissot Mound, just for the fun of it. For here, he has retired. A peaceful retirement, as attested by this daguerreotype, one of his last. Along with this portrait of his cook, and that of his wife, Louise Georgina. Daguerre passed away, taking with him the reflected image of the silver plate. That magical false start of photography. <laughs>